This morning we are in 1 John chapter 2, as I've already mentioned. Let me just reread the section that perhaps it would be the, the burden of the sermon. And that would be in verses 3 through 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. John writes this. By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word in Him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him, the one who says He abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Uh, We won't, well, actually, I do want us to see a couple of things in particular here. Obviously, we do need to follow Jesus Christ, but you do need to understand that when he says uh, this, uh, whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected, what he means by that is it is the evidence that the love that God has put within us has actually produced what it is that it's meant to produce, and that is Christ-likeness. When it says that we are to walk as, as Jesus walked in the same way in which He walked, He walked according to the commandments, you see. And that's why He says we need to keep those commandments. That's the same thing as walking as Jesus walked, but again, for the same reason as well, and that is love. So that's the two things I want us to look at, love and devotion, love and obedience. That's what it means to be devoted to Jesus Christ, to love Him enough to follow Him. Now, again, I told you I wanted to tie this to the book of Hebrews, and I just want to remind you that in the book of Hebrews, which we went through relatively quickly and couldn't comb through all the things that it had to say, I hope you remember how Jesus is superior. But there was one statement that was made by the author to the Hebrews that has so many different meanings that I thought we would come back to that and perhaps take what we've just seen here and attach it to it. And that is that command that we are to run the race. Remember, setting aside everything that entangles us, or actually the sin, which so easily entangles us. And whatever would encumber us, And that would be, of course, nothing spiritual, that at least spiritually good, but the things that are in this world. Set those things aside and run that race, fixing your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to fix your eyes upon Jesus? Well, certainly, He means that as you live this Christian life, that you are to look to Him alone for your salvation. You can't run the race without Jesus. You're not even in the race unless you begin there. We do need to remember, Jesus is the only way of salvation. Jesus is the one who has made the only payment God will accept. He is the only one who has a righteousness that God will approve of. There is no other way. There is nothing you can do. There is nothing any religious cult can do. Don't ever begin to think, too, that... um, You know, these people that come to your door that bring to you another Christ, another way of salvation, that God's going to accept them. He's not. And if you accept their way of salvation, you will be lost. You need to fix your eyes upon Jesus. You need to trust Him alone. Every other way leads to destruction. Now, the author to the Hebrews also meant that as you live, as you seek to run this race, you do need to look to Jesus for strength. Now, even though you already love what it is that He has called you uh, to do, that you realize that's not enough. I mean, He has changed your heart. He has given you this love. But you need to realize there are enemies of that love, enemies that are around you in the world, enemy that is a spiritual enemy, that is the enemy of God, that is Satan. And you have an inborn enemy in your heart, in your affections, in your soul that is still there. There is that sin and corruption. And all of these things are working against you to keep you from running the race. It's entangling you. It's encumbering you or at least causing your heart to go after things that are going to slow you down. Well, you need to call upon Him 
for strength because you're too weak. You need to look to Him for His help, for His Holy Spirit, for the power to overcome these things and to run the race. But certainly, He also meant a couple of other things that I would like for us to focus on this morning. I do believe when He says to fix your eyes on Jesus that He means to do that because that's what you want to do, because you, you love Him, because Jesus is your heart's desire. So, you know, to, to look at Him and let Him draw your heart out and draw your life forward. Jesus is to be your greatest desire, and I think that's what the author has in mind, but also, and perhaps primarily, to look to Him for the example, the example of the kind of life that you are to live, the kind of race that you are to run. Jesus is to be your paradigm, your pattern, the one that you aspire to be like. Remember, John just said, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now, those two points, really devotion to him, that he would be your greatest desire and obedience, really go hand in hand because you will never be able to walk as he walked unless you love him the way that he loved his father. So that's what I want us to consider this morning. Now, the first point is that Jesus is to be the one you desire the most. And again, we could bring many passages of Scripture into this. Jesus said on one occasion, unless you come after me and hate your father and mother, your wife, your children, your lands, and so forth, you can't be my disciple. He certainly meant you need to love him most of all. Paul writes in Galatians 6.24, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. That word means undying. That's the kind of love you have for Him, an undying love. Now, how can you love Jesus Christ that much? Well, you can only do it if you have His Spirit. If you don't have His Spirit, you don't love Him at all, really. And if you think you do, you really don't. But if you don't, you need to come to Him for His Spirit. You need to come to Him and ask for His Spirit. You need to come to Him and ask Him to break the stony heart and to give you a heart of flesh, a heart that beats for Him, a heart that loves Him. That's the only way you can. But realize that even if He has given you such a heart, there is still more that you need to do, more that you can do, more that you're commanded to do. First of all, you do need, I think, and this is perhaps one of the reasons why we languish as we do, you do need to see Him more clearly. Because I think to the degree that you do not see Him, you know, to that degree that He doesn't seem real to you, to that degree you're, you're really not going to love Him. You've got all these things around you that are seeking to draw your affections out to them. And they're there, they're, they're real, I mean, they at least appear to be real. They are real as far as you know, we understand, although there are things unseen which are much more real. But we see these things with our eyes, and they have, it seems, a stronger hold on our hearts. We need to be able to see Jesus. We need to be able to see His love. If He is only a character in a story, if He's only in a book that you read, then He is not what He needs to be to you. He is a real person. He is a real Savior, a real Lord. He is one who has offered Himself for you and one who offers Himself to you and one who has actually given Himself to you if you have received Him. You need to remember that He is real and you need to live as though He is. You need to remember, of course, what He has done for you. That's the one thing we've been focusing on uh, in this service so far this morning. Well, again, we can rehearse everything that He has done, and I would like to just point out a couple of things. Uh, Jesus has done everything that is necessary to save you from a very well-deserved eternity of suffering, suffering in what we would consider to be a lake of fire, which we would imagine burns like fire, and even worse. That's what He saved you from. You see, without Him, your sins would have condemned you. You would be lost without Him. And not only that, but you would have missed out on what would be the greatest blessing that any creature could ever possibly imagine, 
and that is being in the presence of God. Now, again, we need faith to be able to see that. We need faith to apprehend what that is really like. We do need to believe it. But again, I would, I would ask you to consider the price Jesus paid for you. The one who is the creator became a creature infinitely below him. The one who is infinitely holy and loves what is good and right actually came down and lived in this world we live in. How easy is it to live in this world for you who don't love? We don't love righteousness and holiness as much as he did. And we're grieved, as we saw last week, I believe it was, when people do wicked things. It angers us. We should hate those things. It shouldn't just leave us unaffected. Well, we should just kind of expect that because that's the way they are. No, if, if it's like that, we're, we're actually becoming too acclimated to the sin around us. It should provoke us. And that's what it did to him, that he was willing to do that for us. The one who was innocent of any crime was willing to be punished in our place on the cross. And the, the one, again, who was infinitely blessed from all eternity was willing to endure God's wrath against us on the cross. The one who was life itself died and was under the power of death for three days and again the things he went through, he did not deserve. You deserved it. I deserved it. But he was willing to do that for us. He took what was coming to us upon himself. Now think about this for a minute. I mean, when people do nice things for us, we like that, right? It makes us thankful. If um, you know, somebody does some work for you, maybe takes, does your chores for you, Somebody pays a bill that you owe or maybe a fine. Or maybe they forgive you for something that you did to them and you're ingratiated to them because they were willing to do that. I mean, we, we like that and uh, we, we feel, you know, a love towards people who do nice things for us. But how much love then should we feel towards the Lord Jesus Christ because of what He has done for us? I think sometimes... Because Jesus is out of sight, out of mind, sometimes we're more grateful for those little things that people do than for these infinite things that Jesus has done for us. And again, it's also because we hear it so often that we get used to it and it doesn't impact us the way it should. We celebrate the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day and, and we remind it about the death of Christ and His infinite love and we get used to it. And so we don't think about it as we should, but we do need to think about it because he is a real person who is really God, who really became a man, who really did do these things for us. He did it for you if you're trusting Jesus Christ. Now, again, if, if, you're, if you're not seeing things the way you should, what you really need is a greater faith, this, this acclamation, this getting used to it, as it were, and you know, it's becoming common to us is really... A, a weakening of our faith. We need a greater faith to see it. Remember, faith is the evidence of things not seen. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You need to believe that He is. You need to seek Him. You need to believe by faith that His Son actually did these things for you if you are trusting Him. So if you are to love Him as you should, you do need a stronger faith to see that He is real and to see that these things are real if they are to have the kind of impact on your life that they need to have. Uh, again, I, that's, that's the one thing I think that is usually predominantly in our minds as to why we love Jesus Christ is because of what He has done, but let's not forget who He is. And the fact that what He has done speaks volumes of who He is. I mean, look at his mercy. Look at his infinite condescension, his stooping, as it were, to meet our needs. Consider his heart. Consider his character. Consider this one who has loved you in this way. And again, what he did is so good and so right and so holy and so merciful. Consider this one who is God and the love with which He loves you, consider how beautiful God is because all of that beauty is in Christ. And let that stir your heart to love Him more. 
Now, again, that's, that's all well and good. I think we understand that, but I think still we have a disconnect between seeing those things and understanding whether they're really having the impact in our lives that they should have. How can you know that you really do love Jesus Christ in the way that you're supposed to love Him, in the way that His love or His love for you demands that you love Him? Well, it's not hard to tell with other people, is it? You know, you can tell whether you love them or not, right? By the way you treat them, by whether or not you want to spend time with them. What do you think about Jesus? When you do think about Jesus, how do you feel? What does it do to your affections? Does it stir your heart? If you love Jesus Christ, are you spending time with Him? Don't you spend time with people that you love? Uh, Do you listen to Him? Because you know He is speaking to you. All of us, you know, if we love the Lord, we want to read His Word. We want to let Him speak to us. As a matter of fact, that's what He's doing right now. He is speaking to us. If we love Him, we'll listen to Him. Are you, are you listening to Him? Okay, are you listening? And are you seeking to remember what He has said to you? You know how we, when somebody who loves, we love very much says something, we, we listen to every word and we, you know, we want to hold on to that because it comes from the one we love. Well, these words come from the one we love the most. Are you listening to what he says? Are you remembering those things? Let me put it in other terms, and here I'll draw a little bit on the study that Dick was leading us in on Wednesday. Is Jesus your hero? I think that was a very good question. Do you admire Jesus? Do you want to be like him? Do you want to be like him more than anyone else? You see, those you choose to be your heroes, those you admire, uh, say a great deal about you says a great deal about what's in your heart. Now, if you are a believer, a genuinely love Jesus Christ, Jesus should be your hero. He should be the one you admire the most. And really, no one else should be even a close second. By comparison, we should actually hate them. Is He the one you want to be most like? Is He the one that you look to, the one you hold on to? Again, the one you aspire to. Now, as Spurgeon also said in the book that we're reading in the, in the last section of the first chapter, Jesus is the one that your faith is to be built upon. He is to be your reason to believe and to hope. Uh, so many people, you know, again, come to church for a variety of reasons and they <clears throat> base their hope of heaven on things they shouldn't be basing them on. Perhaps they come to church on Spurgeon's Day. I imagine the temptation was to come to hear Spurgeon. But you've got this big church with all these people gathered together. If you remove Spurgeon, would they still be there? If they remove your friends and, and they're not there any longer, would you still be there, you see? And if they're not playing the kind of music that you like to listen to, would you still be there? Why are you going? What is your faith based on why are you worshiping the Lord? Spurgeon talked about many Christians are like houses built together that are leaning on one another. You pull one of them out and they all fall down. Well, your faith, your hope needs to be based upon Jesus Christ. He needs to be your hero. He needs to be the one you love most of all. And He needs to be the reason why you are here this morning. He needs to be the reason why, as we'll see in a moment, you live. So that even if all these things were removed and even if all the people in the church turned against Him, you would not. You would not abandon Him. You would hold fast to Him because your love and your faith are placed firmly upon Jesus Christ. He is the rock upon which your life <clears throat> is built. And not just His work abstractly. I'm trusting this work to save me, but I'm still going after everything else that I want to go after. This is the one you love and you stand firm on Him. You follow Him. You are devoted to Him. Now, some of you are about to make public profession of your faith, about to be interviewed by the session. And in that interview, you're going to be asked, if you're trusting Jesus Christ, you're going to be asked questions about the gospel, of course, too, but when it gets to testimony, do you, are you trusting Jesus Christ? And, of course, the most important question, which is the evidence that you are trusting Him, Do you love Him? 
Now, you know what? I don't think I've ever seen anybody who's been asked that question ever say no, but they will all profess to say, yes, I love Jesus Christ more than anything else in the world. Well, this passage and what we're looking at this morning calls you to examine yourself regarding that confession. Whether you've, you're going to say it at the interview or whether you've already said it in the interview, yes, I love Jesus Christ more than anything else. Do you? Do you really? Well, how often do you think about Him? How often do you spend time with Him? Is Jesus the one you admire the most? Is Jesus your hero? And this brings us into the second point that I want us to see, because it's another way that you can tell whether or not you really do love Him, and that is whether you're following Him. We haven't actually dealt with that fully yet. Is Jesus your example? Is He the one you pattern your life after? Are you really walking according to Him? Jesus says, if anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Do you keep His word? Not just do you know it, have you read it, do you understand it, but do you actually keep it? Jesus said in our meditation, if you come to Him and take His yoke upon you, you need to learn from Him. Are you a student of Jesus Christ? Are you a disciple of His? Are you learning from Him? And again, in our circles, our danger is, yeah, I have my theology book, you know, I've got my commentaries, I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm stocking my head full of knowledge, I know, I am learning. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about here. That's the means to the end, but the end is obedience. Is that the kind of learning that you're learning? You're learning to become more like Him. Jesus says in our text, the one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as He walked. Is that the way that you're living? Well, if you love Him, then you are. This is the evidence. John says that you really have come to know Him, not just that you think you've trusted Him, but you really have. You can believe that you're trusting Him and still not really be trusting Him. The evidence that you really do love Him more than any other is going to be your life, not just what you say, but what you do. Again, I would point you to the sheep and goat judgment on that day. They're not going to be judged on their profession, what it is they said they believed or who it is they said they loved. You know, they didn't say to the sheep, do you love me? But he will say to them, I was in prison, you visited me. I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. In other words, I don't have to ask you whether you love me. You showed me that you love me. And the others, the goats on the left, did not. Does your life show that you love Him, really. 1 John 2, our text here, verses 3 through 6, let me read it again. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. If, can't miss the if. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word in Him, the love of God has truly been Perfected. In other words, the Spirit of God has produced that fruit. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If you love Him, you will obey Him. Now, I told you I wanted to tie the, uh, the movie Chariots of Fire into this as well because I think it did provide for us a marvelous example of the two kinds of people we find in the visible church. Now, again... Both of these men that the movie was about were not professing Christians, but I still think that they are both examples of what we find here. There are those who seek their own pleasure and glory, and there are those who seek Christ's pleasure and glory. Now, those of you who have seen the movie, those of you who are here, you realize Abrams, Harold Abrams, I mean, he was driven. He was, you know, he had a goal. He wanted something. He said he was addicted to running. He, it was a compulsion. He wanted to win. He wouldn't actually run unless he believed he could win. 
He did want personal glory. I think that was quite clear. And he also wanted to use it as a weapon to make room for the Jewish community, as it were, because he believed they were being perhaps uh, slighted. And maybe they were. Now, he made, again, no pretense of being a Christian. But how many people do say they're Christians and yet live exactly the same way that he lived? How many are seeking their own pleasure and their own glory rather than the Lord's? Now, Little, on the other hand, we know is a great example of someone whose heart was really committed to the Lord. And he used the gifts that God gave him not for his own personal glory, though attention certainly came to him because he was gifted, but he used it for God's glory. He ran because he believed it was God's will that he run. And when he won, and perhaps even if he didn't win, there, when there were those signs, come and listen to him speak. He was first and foremost a Christian. And when there was attention drawn to him because of his gifts, he used it to draw attention to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to give Jesus glory, by the way, in case we wonder you know, what that term means. It means that when something good comes my way, if he does something good through me, I give him the credit for it, and I don't take it for myself. Because we are not to take glory to ourselves. If there is glory to be given to us, God will give it to us. We don't seek it. We don't take it. We give it to Him. And remember that the other outstanding thing about Eric Little was his unwillingness to compromise. Do you think Jesus compromised? Of course not. Well, the one who says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. Do you think that passage was going through Eric Little's mind when he was told that the events that he had actually trained for and was on the team for were going to be run on Sunday? He could not compromise. He had to walk as Jesus walked, and he refused to compromise, even though, as you saw, the British Athletic Committee, the Prince of Wales, his team members, and all his country were looking to him to run that race for them. Even with all that pressure, he refused to violate his conscience. He had to walk as Jesus walked. Now, it was a hard decision to make, but it was the right one. Remember when his coach turns to him, any regrets, Eric, that you're not down there with him? He said yes, and I wonder if he would have even said that. He said yes, but no doubts. And you know that the Lord honored him for that stand that he took because it basically forced him to run in a race that he wasn't, it wasn't really what he thought was his forte, and it turned out to be the one that he was best at, and that was the 400 meter for which he won the gold medal. Now, if you love the Lord, you will do the same thing. You will obey him, and you will refuse to compromise even though it may cost you dearly. Why do we have all these examples recorded for us in Scripture of these people who went through such difficulties and such sufferings as Elijah, who at one time was you know, being fed in the wilderness because everybody was out for his blood, or Stephen, who was stoned to death, or Paul, who gives us basically a catalog of all the things that he went through, and of course, you know, I think one of the greatest examples in church history of Athanasius, Athanasius against the world, right? And then Luther, declared an outlaw, could have been killed on the spot, everything taken away from him. Why were they willing to do that? Because they weren't willing to compromise. To be a Christian, to love the Lord and to be devoted to Him may cost you dearly, but that's a price you're willing to pay. Again, consider what it cost Jesus in His love and devotion to His Father. He did what was right. He did not compromise, and He wasn't applauded even by the church of His day. They hated Him, and they turned Him over to the Romans for crucifixion. By the way, that was a, very, that was a great comfort to Maria, as I mentioned in my prayers, if you, if you heard, if you're following. You know, she's going through a great deal of persecution right now for doing what is good and right, trying to bring... Christ to her family members, trying to evangelize her mother and just care for her, just love her and, and love them. And they hate her for it. Not all of them, thankfully. Some of them are coming around and they're seeing how she's, you know, basically behaving and enduring under the persecution and it's beginning to be noticed. It's beginning to change their hearts. Her life is a much greater witness than her words. And that is often why the Lord calls us to suffer 
Uh, why, when we stand up, as it were, and stand out for the Lord and we suffer for it, he, he brings that about so that we might bring a stronger testimony to the reality of these things we say we believe. This is devotion to the Lord. Well, Jesus gave his life for his Father because he loved him. And he calls you to give your life to him out of love for him. Now, are we going to fail as we seek to do this? Oh, yeah, we're going to fail. We're going to fail miserably and perhaps many times, but we won't stop. We won't give up. We will keep running forward. We will keep running the race because that's what love, the love of God in our hearts, will do. It will keep us running forward. I think again about what Little said in the movie, or at least what he's represented as saying, where does, the, where does the power to run the race comes from? Where does it come from? It comes from within. The kingdom of heaven was within you. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that everybody in the world has the kingdom in their hearts, but it does mean if you're trusting Jesus, you have the Spirit of God in your hearts. The kingdom is in you. That is what you want. That is what you run for. That is what you love. And so that's what keeps you moving forward. So if you have the kingdom in your heart, you will love the Lord. You will devote yourself to Him. You can do that, even as the saints of old. Now, again, um, we, we have many examples of people outside the Bible who actually did love the Lord and devoted themselves to Him. My, my favorite examples are Spurgeon, Whitfield, of course, Edwards I've noted on numerous occasions. There's many, many others. Now, we don't have their gifts. We're not going to be able to do what they did. You know, there's this, obviously God had His purposes. He gave His gifts. That was His will. But just because we don't have His gifts doesn't mean that you can't have a heart like they had. You can love the Lord just like they did. You can actually love Him more than they did. You can be even more devoted. And that is what the Lord says you must strive to do. And so fix your eyes upon Jesus Christ. Look to Him as your Savior. Look to Him for daily strength. Uh, let your love for Him continue to grow. And in that love, devote yourself to Him. Don't set your sights on anything less than becoming like Him in every way. Do not leave any room in your life for compromise. That's what Paul meant when he said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lusts. That's compromise. Compromise is a language of the devil, we were told in the movie, and it is. That is what the Lord calls you to do, and that is something He has given you the power to do if you really are a believer here this morning. If you're not, if that's not your desire, if you don't love Him and you haven't devoted your life to Him, that's what you need to do before you can really, oh, you, lead, you need the Holy Spirit before you can do that. You need to look to Jesus Christ. You need to ask Him for His grace in order to trust Him. But just remember, being a Christian is nothing less than what we've just read. This is what the Lord calls you to do. This is what He empowers you to do. This is your purpose. This is your goal, to love Him and devote yourself to Him in this way. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to know the condition of our hearts. And if we find that we are lacking, and we're all lacking, of course, in, in a great measure, Let's ask Him to give us the grace to begin again to love Him more and to pursue devoting ourselves to Him even more.